Hello, and uh, thank you for this opportunity to present uh, our talk to what I understand is a wide audience. So this is very exciting. Today, I'm going to be talking about a symptom recovery, which is an inducible form of plant tolerance to virus infection in plants. And uh, I'm going to talk about the molecular mechanisms that are regulating symptom recovery. But before I do that, I first wanted to give you a brief introduction of the infection cycle of positive strand RNA plant viruses. And I'm going to take tomato ring spot virus as an example, because this is our favorite virus, and that's the virus I'll be describing and using as a model system in the rest of the talk. So viruses will first uh, infect the cells, and they enter the cells as an encapsidated viral uh, particle. Uh, after decapsidation, the viral RNA will be released, and the first thing that needs to happen is the viral RNA must be translated. And this will happen through uh, using the translation machinery of the host. Uh, so the virus uh, completely dependent on its host for this step and for actually all the step of its infection cycle. After translation, uh, you have release of the viral protein, and in the case of many plant viruses, about half of plant viruses, including tomato ring spot virus, a polyprotein is released that is then cleaved by a viral protease. Once the mature viral proteins are there, you have formation of viral RNA replication complex. And uh, basically, the RNA and the replication protein encoded by the virus will assemble with, uh, in complexes that are in association with intracellular membranes from the host. And what will happen is that you will have this massive membrane proliferation, and you can see this on this EM picture that I showed on the corner of the slide and that I represented here uh, on the uh, right of the side as membrane vesicles. This complex will allow the formation of a new uh, uh, viral RNA progeny which is then encapsidated, and that requires the viral coat protein. And eventually, the virus will move from cell to cell into the next cells. And in the case of tomato ring spot virus, it does that through the formation of tubular structures. So a few points I want to make about this uh, replication cycle is that first, viruses hijack and modify host intracellular membranes and proteins facilitate their infection. So they're completely dependent on their host. And also, virus inf infection can cause profound change in the plant physiology, and that can be one of the causes of visible symptom and the disease. Also, what uh, perhaps the most important point is that viruses depend on the fit host to multiply. So if the host is too damaged, that will also hinder the virus infection cycle. Now, plants defend themselves against virus infection. One of the first things they do in recognition of a pathogen attack is induce defense response. And this happens by a, a reprogramming of the transcriptome in the nucleus and activation of defense genes. Then uh, one of the pathways that are uh, activated uh, targets uh, degradation of the viral RNA, and this can happen with RNA silencing mechanism or with RNA decay pathways. Another strategy used by plants is translation repression, so blocking the translation of the viral RNA, and this can happen in a specific manner by RNA silencing, and I'm going to show you an example of this. The plant can also defend itself by specifically degrading viral proteins uh, through one of the plant degradation pathways. And also, uh, yeah, there is activation of salicylic acid-mediated response that can do many things, but mostly block the viral movement through the plant. And so all of these defense response, they're not always all activated, but 
uh, there is always multiple layers of plant defense that are activated in cells that are infected by plant viruses. The virus counterattacked uh, the plant, and so there are counter defense responses. Uh, viruses have a way to uh, reprogram themselves, the plant transcriptome, to prevent the induction of defense responses. They also encode protein to suppress RNA silencing and prevent the degradation of viral RNA or the repression of the translation. Viruses actually have learned to use the plant degradation pathways to eliminate plant defense proteins. So they use their own plant defense response against the plant. And viruses also encode proteins to counteract salicylic acid mediated responses. And again, many of those things can happen simultaneously in the plant. So there are multiple layers of plant virus interaction. And I'm going to describe a little bit more RNA silencing because it's one of the main defense response of the plant. Um, and it's initiated by the production of double strand RNAs, uh, which are normally not found in plants, so it's recognized as a foreign object. And it's, uh, they are produced during the steps of viral replication. Uh, they are recognized by dicer-like enzymes from the plants, which will then cleave this RNA to produce small interfering RNAs. Those small interfering RNAs, which are specific for the virus, are incorporated into RNA silencing induced complex, also called RISC. And those complex contain one argonaut protein, which we abbreviate as AGO. And then there will be sequence specific silencing. And most of the time, this will result in the cleavage of the viral RNA at the site corresponding to the binding of the um, small uh, interfering RNA. So there is a sequence specific silencing in this case. This is a very simplified version of RNA silencing. There are more steps, but I'm just presenting you a simplified version. One thing that I do want to say, though, is that there are multiple silencing pathways occurring in the plants, and there are multiple agoproteins in plants. For example, in Arabidopsis thaliana, which is a model of host, there are 10 different argonaut proteins that play roles on different pathways. And viral suppressors of silencing can block one or several steps of these pathways. So I think I've tried to highlight that there is a complex layers of plant-virus interaction, and, and these interaction will uh, determine the outcome of infection. And so you can see this as a gradient of plant-virus interaction where if you consider the plant fitness in green at the top and the virus fitness in red at, at the bottom, you can see that in the case of a resistant interaction, the plant fitness will be very high, but the virus will not replicate to very high level. In a susceptible interaction, the plant will get diseased and you will have a low fitness of the plant and the virus will replicate at high level. But there is this in-between stage, which we refer to as tolerance, and which you could consider as the perfect balancing act. And in this case, the virus is still present, but caused little damage to the plant. This is advantageous for the plant because the plant defenses are primed, and so it's uh, responding better to the presence of the virus. But it's also an advantage for the virus because the virus persists, it keeps its host fit, and it is transmissible to other plants. So now I'm going to introduce symptom recovery. So it's a phenomenon that was actually uh, already described in 1928 by Vingard. And I'm showing you here the original picture uh, from the Vingard paper, where what he showed is that when you have a plant that is initially uh, diseased, uh, as a result of infection with nipovirus, uh, you will then find that later in infection, new leaves emerge that are asymptomatic and they look completely healthy, but in fact, they still have virus in there. So 
um, this was an interesting phenomenon and nobody really knew what uh, was the molecular mechanism regulating this. It's only at the end of the 90s that it was recognized that symptom recovery from a NEPO virus is linked with the induction of plant antiviral RNA silencing. And what they showed is that the viral RNA concentration is reduced in the recovered leaves, and this happened in the sequence-specific manner, but the virus persists and it is transmissible to other plants. And so, um, this raised the interesting question of whether symptom recovery is a form of inducible tolerance. So the plant gets to that disease state first, but then gets into that happy medium where it's still healthy, um, but maintains the virus. So I'm going to give you a little bit more introduction about tomato ring spot virus. Um, so uh, those are the virus particles, so it's a spherical virus, and those are the symptoms that are uh, produced on an initial leaf. It's a serious pathogen of fruit trees and small fruits in North America, so it's transmitted by seeds and nematodes. Um, it has a very wide host range, including many herbaceous hosts who often in the field will serve as reservoir for the virus. But because it has such a wide host range, it's a very good model system to study plant-virus interaction. Um, and it belongs to the genus Nepovirus family Secoveridae, which contains many other important uh, pathogens. And uh, tomato ring spot virus consists of two RNAs. Each of the RNAs uh, encodes one large polyprotein, which is cleaved by the viral protease. The viral protease is encoded by RNA1. RNA1 also encodes other proteins involved in the replication of the virus. And RNA2 involves uh, the coat protein, which encapsulates the particle, and the movement protein, which assists in the cell to cell movement of the virus. Now, let me get to the, the meat of the talk, and uh, I want to show you what happens when a, a Nicotiana bentamiana plant is inoculated with tomato ring spot virus. And uh, you will see symptoms on the inoculated leaf, uh, and, and you will see here a close up of a lesion on the inoculated leaf, and you can understand why it's called tomato ring spot virus. Um, and so this is what happens on the inoculated leaf. And then later in infection, the virus will move up to upper leaves. And you will end up with systemic symptoms that often correspond to vein clearing. So it's a kind of a, a necrosis along the vein. But much later in infection, then you will see that the plant completely recovered from infection and the new leaves are apparently healthy. So the first thing that we did when we started uh, looking at this phenomenon is to see how much virus is actually present in those leaves at the different stage of infection. And we expected that there would be less virus in the recovered leaf because this is what had been reported for other nipple viruses. But to our surprise, the level of viral RNA were maintained during the course of infection. And in fact, there were very high level of viral RNA in the recovered leaf, as I'm showing you here on this northern blot. So then the next question was, OK, there's still a lot of viral RNA. Is RNA silencing active against tomato ring spot virus in recovered leaf? So what we did to that is we compared two types of plants, plants that were healthy, or leaves that were recovered from Tomaris V infection. And we uh, injected those leaves with um, two types of constructs. One was, uh, so in each case, we had the green fluorescent protein as a reported gene. And in the bottom construct here, uh, where I show this uh, little square in the red, those are tomato ring spot virus sequence. So the idea is that if silencing is already pre-induced against tomato ring spot virus, it should target this construct and prevent its expression. And in fact, this is what we saw. If you look on the bottom panels uh, uh, on the right here, you can see that in healthy plants, the green fluorescence protein is expressed very well, and we see high level of fluorescence, but it's not expressed in tomato ring spot virus. 
the recovered leaf, indicating that silencing against some RSV is active in these leaves. And we have a control where the, the bit of sensor uh, gene that we added is from a different virus, cucumber necrosis virus. And in this case, the GFC protein is expressed very well into a healthy and recovered leaf. So this indicated to us that RNA silencing specific to tomato ring spot virus was active in recovered leaves. Another thing that we did is to look whether small RNAs were present, and especially those that were specific for tomato race spot virus. So we used northern blot again, and we could show that indeed there is small RNA specific for tomato ring spot virus active in these leaves. So this tells us that yes, RNA silencing is active, but it's not managing to bring down the concentration of viral RNA. So something else is happening. Um, and I forgot to mention that all the work I've uh, presented before was the beautiful work of, uh, and I'm going to, to go back to that slide, of uh, Juan Rovell and Melanie Walker, and I'm uh, indicating the reference to uh, the journal at the end at the bottom of the slide. At that point, uh, a new student came in the lab, Bashudev Goshal, and uh, he was interested in looking at the molecular mechanism of this in more detail. And we took advantage of an interesting phenomenon that the um, symptom recovery is actually dependent on the growth temperature of the plants. And so you can see that plants grown at 27 degrees uh, will go through a phase of infection and disease in inoculated leaf and in symptomatic leaf, but will eventually recover from infection. And if you look at the picture of the plant on the right side at 20 dpi, it's a reasonably happy plant. The same virus infected on the same batch of plants, but let grown at 21 degrees, you will see that the plant really gets very severely diseased and is unable to recover from infection. So um, what Bashu Dev did is uh, to look at uh, what's happening in those leaves treated at 21 degrees or 27 degrees. And we looked at initial uh, leaves or leaves later in infection that in 21 degrees were severely diseased or in 27 degrees were recovered. And he first looked at the concentration of viral RNA and showed the same as uh, we had shown before, where the uh, concentration of viral RNA was maintained in recovered leaves. But interestingly, when he looked at the level of viral protein, he saw that while there was a high concentration of viral proteins early in infection at 27 degrees, there was very little viral protein later in infection. In contrast, at 21 degrees, at the same time, at eight days post infection, you have very high concentration of viral protein. So something is happening there. And to try to figure out what's happening is uh, Bashudev used uh, methods of in vivo labeling, where he detached leaves at different stage of infection, and then uh, incubated those with labeled methionine, which would label all the proteins that are actively being translated. And then he did an immunoprecipitation with coat protein specific antibody to purify the coat protein and to look by uh, um, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis uh, to look at the labeling of these proteins. And what I'm going to show you first is just a commercy blue stain gel. So we're looking here at all the proteins present in, the, in these leaves. And you can see that early in infection, uh, you have uh, an increasing amount of protein. But then later on, the level of uh, a coat protein diminish, and uh, the coat protein is shown by the red arrows here. And then when we looked at what was actually labeled, that's when we got a very interesting result, because we noticed that proteins were actively labeled early in infection, but were not labeled later in infection. 
So this indicated to us that the translation of the viral RNAs were actually repressed during infection. The next thing that uh, Bashudev did is uh, to look at the role of different argonaut proteins in this phenomenon. And I mentioned to you that Arabidopsis italiana encodes many different argonaut proteins. But we look at argonaut 1 and argonaut 2 predominantly because these two proteins were previously reported to be involved in plant virus resistance. And we also looked at argonaut 4 as a control. And what you can see here, what we did is to specifically uh, knock down the expression of either AGO1, AGO2, or AGO4. And you can see that plants that were knocked down for AGO1 were unable to recover from infections, while uh, controlled plants or plants uh, knocked down for AGO2 or AGO4 could recover from infection. And when the when Bashu uh, looked at uh, the concentration of viral RNA and cold protein, he could see a high concentration of viral RNA in all of these plants, uh, all of the recovered plants, uh, the tumorously infected plants, but only in the argonaut one deficient plant could he see the cold protein being uh, produced. So uh, from this, we have a model for the, an AGO1-dependent translation repression associated with symptom recovery to tomato ring spot virus infection, in which, so the first step is what I showed you before, but now we can say that when plants are grown at 27 degrees and infected with tomato ring spot virus, the siRNA are probably incorporated by AGO1. And rather than uh, causing uh, the cleavage of viral RNA, this caused a blockage of the translation of the viral RNA. So this was one of the first examples where uh, translation repression was shown as a mechanism to uh, uh, silence of viral RNAs. So uh, I told you before that viruses defend themselves uh, against the plant defense response. And uh, we looked at several proteins, but I'm going to show you our results with the tomato ring spot virus code protein. And uh, we have evidence that it suppressed silencing of GFP reporter gene. And so I'm first going to introduce the system. We take healthy plants and we express high level of the green fluorescence reporter gene. And because we're expressing high level of this, this will induce the plant RNA silencing against this GFP reported gene. And then we can co-express viral protein and see if they suppress the GFP silencing. So here, I'm first going to show you the control experiment where uh, when the GFP is expressed alone, we have production of small amounts of GFP protein uh, and of GFP messenger RNA, but we see uh, high levels of small interfering RNA corresponding to the GFP, and that indicates to us that the silencing is indeed active against the green fluorescence protein. When we add the Tombis virus P19 protein, which is very well-known suppressor of silencing, we have an increase in the amount of GFP protein, an increase in the le level of GFP messenger RNA, and a decrease in the level of GFP siRNA. And this is because this protein sequesters the siRNA to prevent the silencing. Now, when we look at the Tomaris V coat protein, uh, what would happen, we added the Tomaris V coat protein, we see an induction of the GFP protein produced but no effect on the concentration of GFP messenger RNA and no effect on the GFP siRNA. So it's a completely different mechanism of silencing suppression. And uh, we suspected that it might have to do with the level of translation of GFP mRNA. So we use a different uh, in vivo, uh, a met uh, a same method of in vivo labeling that I described before. And we could see that indeed the translation rate of GFP was greatly increased in plants that were in, um, co uh, inoculated with some RSV code protein. And this was the work of Rajita Karan in the lab. Now, uh, I have to say that uh, although we did see um, 
uh, uh, silencing suppression with the code protein. It was not always as efficient as I'm showing you here. It depended on the specific conditions. And so we would rather refer to the TOMRSV code protein as a rather weak suppressor of silencing. And so now we have an updated model where I'm still showing you what I showed you before with uh, the presence of Argonaut 1, which repressed the translation of viral RNA. But now we have the TOMRSV code protein that will prevent this mechanism and uh, re-allow the production of viral RNA translation. But as I said, this is not a very efficient mechanism. So there is a balance between the silencing suppression and the silencing. And uh, one of the ways that the TOMRSV code protein does that is that it uses the plant uh, degradation machinery to regulate the degradation of argonaut 1. But to, and I'm not going to have time to show you all this data, but we also have evidence that the plants counteract by, in turn, doing a regulated degradation of the code protein. So it's a very highly regulated mechanism. Now, uh, at this point, we were also interested in uh, seeing what would happen with other isolates and uh, with other temperatures. So I'm introducing you now two isolates. Uh, RASP1 is the isolate that I described to you before, which we cover at 27 degrees, but is very necrotic at 21 degrees. And GYV is a mild strain with plants recovering at both temperatures. And what was interesting is that silencing of Argonaut 1 did not prevent symptom recovery from the mild strain at 21 degrees. And so we thought there is probably a different mechanism happening and possibly another Argonaut 1 involved. So Dinesh Babu Podel came in the lab at that point, and this is work that was also initiated by uh, Bashudev Goshal and uh, Sushma Josie also participated in uh, this work. And uh, basically what uh, Dinesh did was to look at the induction of another argonaut uh, that is a well-known antiviral uh, uh, enzyme. And we found that if we look at the level of messenger RNA during the course of infection, um, we're seeing a spike of induction of argonaut 2 messenger RNA in both RAT1 and GYV infected plants early in infection. And, but then when he looked at the R level of Argonaut 2 protein, we got a little bit of a surprise. All the plants that later recovered from infection, and I'm showing you this with the green uh, circle, showed a high level of Argonaut 2 protein early in infection. But under conditions where plants did not recover from infection, as shown in red here, we did not see an accumulation of Argonaut 2 protein. So this was interesting to us, and we did a bunch of uh, experiments, which I'm not going to have time to show you to you today. And we showed that, in fact, Argonaut 2 degradation is differentially regulated in tomorrowly infected plants. So then we thought, OK, Argonaut 2 is induced. It's only, the protein is only present in plants that are later going to recover infection. Does it play a role in symptom recovery? So we collaborated with a group in Hungary, the group of Caroli Fetiol, which have produced Argonaut 2 deficient plants. And what to our surprise, what we found is that even though uh, Argonaut 2 deficient plants showed increased accumulation of viral RNA and viral uh, proteins, in fact, they still recovered from infection. So next, uh, what uh, Dinesh did was to uh, look again at uh, the uh, expression of different argonauts. So I'm showing you argonaut 2 here. I showed you this data before. So in wild type protein uh, plants, the argonaut 2 protein is uh, induced at late, early in infection. In argonaut 2 deficient plants, it's not. There is still a little bit of argonaut 2, but at much higher, lower level. And uh, argonaut 1 uh, is actually expressed pretty constitutively regardless of the state of infection. But what we saw is that argonaut 5 and argonaut 7 are also upregulated during tomato ring spot virus infection. 
So at this point, we're thinking that it's likely that there is various argonauts that could play complementary and overlapping roles uh, during uh, uh, recovery to tomato ring spot virus infection. And so the take home message now are that diverse molecular mechanism regulates symptom recovery and the balance between plant defense and virus counter defense determine the outcome of infection and this is influenced by var environmental conditions. Uh, we're still doing some work on this. We're uh, looking at transcriptomic analysis of symptomatic and recovery to see what else is happening there. But the main take home message that I want to leave you with is that the best adapted virus is one that does not damage its host too much, but that still managed to persist. And I also want to state that this is quite often observed in natural environments actually. And I'm just going to finish by thanking the lab members and collaborators. I've talked about the work of Juan Covell, Melanie Walker, Bashudev Gojal, Rajita Karan, Dinesh Babu Podel, and Sushma Chuti during my talk. We have collaborators, Carrie Fafiol, that produce, provided us with the IgoTo mutant, Peter Moffat and Herman Scholkoff gave us vectors for sciencing of Argonauts. And uh, I'm also acknowledging funding from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and from an insert discovery grant. And uh, I take any question from here.